During this lecture, we're going to go over the structure of the eukaryotic cell and talk a little bit about the physiology of the cell. So I'm going to start off with an overview about the eukaryotic cell, go over the plasma membrane and the different types of membrane transport, such as uh, diffusion, osmosis, uh, receptor-mediated uh, diffusion, that kind of stuff. Then we're going to talk about the different cell organelles as well. So here's an image of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is a bilipid layer, and it's made up of phospholipids. Now, all these red beads that you see over here, let's see, all of these red beads that you see over here are the lipid heads. So each one of these lipid molecules has a polar head, and two nonpolar tails. What this means is that the heads are hydrophilic, meaning that they're water attracting, and the tails are water repelling or hydrophobic. So you see the sea of, or the ocean of, the phospholipid molecules right here. These phospholipid molecules are, so sometimes in this ocean you see some glycoproteins, which is nothing. Glyco means carbohydrate, protein, as proteins. So glycoproteins are carbs and proteins together. Or you could have glycolipids, which is carbohydrates and lipids together. So you have the phospholipid bilayer, you have scattered around in this bilayer, you have glycoproteins and glycolipids. And what you have, these blue structures right here, are the membrane proteins. So membrane proteins can be of two types. One, you can have trans membrane proteins, also known as integral membrane proteins. So they span the entire width of the bilayer. So you can see how they're spanning the entire width right here. So those are called integral or transmembrane proteins. And the other type of proteins are that do not span the entire length of the bilayer right here and right here. These are called peripheral proteins or surface proteins. So my next slide, we're going to go over the different types of proteins that are found in the cell membrane. So the first picture here talks about ion channels. So ion channels are proteins that allow specific ions. So sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium, chloride, um, so different ions, very, very small ions to move into and outside the cell. So those are ion channels, and they're a type of integral protein, meaning that they span the entire length or the width of the plasma membrane. The next protein we come to, which is also a transmembrane or an integral protein, is a carrier protein. Now, the carrier protein does something similar to what the ion channel protein does, but instead of carrying ions, it's carrying much bigger molecules. So it could be carrying carbohydrates, it could be carrying amino acids, lipids, that kind of stuff. So ion channels are for small ions, carrier proteins are for molecules. Now the third type of protein, which is also a transmembrane protein right here, is a receptor protein. Now what a receptor, when you think about the term receptor, it means that it is going to receive something. So a receptor protein could be a specific ligand that receives a molecule of some kind. So when it receives the molecule and the, the receptor protein and this molecule bind, they're going to alter the function of the cell in some way. So it's creating a metabolic change, if you will. The next type of protein is an enzyme. Now, enzymes are catalysts, and they can either be transmembrane or they can be surface proteins. So they can be integral or they can be peripheral. Now, what enzymes do that they cat catalyze biochemical reactions? So one example that this slide is giving you is the, the activity of the enzyme lactase. Now, lactase is an enzyme that breaks down the sugar that is found in milk, which is called lactose. Now, it's converting lactose and breaking it down into blood sugar. So it's, it's hydrolyzing lactose. So it's an enzyme. It's catalyzing this reaction. 
The next type of protein, which can also be either a transmembrane or a surface protein, is a linker. So a linker protein usually form participates in some kind of a anchoring mechanism between two cells. So they, they basically function in cell junction, so they help with bonding cells together. The next type of protein, and this is a glycoprotein, so carbohydrate and protein together, are cell identity markers, also known as major histocompatibility proteins, or MHCs. Now what these proteins do is that they distinguish between self versus non-self. So these are surveying your body and recognizing what is part of your own body versus what is foreign. Now anything that is foreign, you want your body to get rid of. However, you do not want your body to get rid of what is yours because that would lead to autoimmune disorders. Now moving on to membrane transport. Membrane transport can be classified based on whether it requires ATP or whether it happens without the use of ATP. Now, the transport that does not require ATP is called passive transport versus one that does require ATP or adenosine triphosphate is called active transport. Now, types of passive transport are diffusion and osmosis. So I'm going to make another video explaining diffusion and osmosis. But in a nutshell, what diffusion is, is that it is the transport of nutrients from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The key term here is nutrients. This nutrient could be a salt, it could be an amino acid, it could be a sugar, it could be a lip, uh, not, not a lipid, but uh, it, some kind of a salt, a water-soluble substance of some kind. Now, movement of this nutrient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is called diffusion. Now, think back to in your general biology classes when you did all of those labs using the dialysis membrane. So think about from where to where the glucose would move and how diffusion is taking place. Now, conversely, osmosis is when you are tracking water. So in osmosis, you are tracking how water is moving. Now, when water moves from an area of low nutrient concentration to an area of high nutrient concentration, it is called osmosis. So you're, you're tracking the movement of water, but you're tracking it based on the concentration of the nutrient. So the key term here is nutrient as well. So movement of water is osmosis, movement of nutrients is diffusion. Now moving on to active transport. Now anytime you have to move substances against its concentration gradient. So think about paddling downstream versus paddling upstream. It is more difficult to go against the, the gradient than it is to kind of coast with the gradient. So paddling downstream is a lot easier than paddling upstream. One example of this that we will deal with when we get to our nerve impulses chapter is the sodium potassium pump. It's a pump that pushes sodium against its concentration gradient and potassium against its concentration gradient. And that is an example of active transport. Now, the next organelle that we're going to go over is the cytoskeleton. So think about cytoskeleton as a network. It's a framework of proteins that is pre present inside of a cell that gives the cell its distinct shape. It helps with cell division and it provides some kind of a structural organization for the cell. So it's a skeleton within a cell and it's made up of proteins. Now, the cytoskeleton has three structural components. The first one is microfilament. Now, a microfilament looks like a string of beads, and it's made up of the protein actin. It looks like a string of beads. The next protein is called an intermediate filament. An intermediate filament 
Think of a bunch of cables that are twisted together. That is what an intermediate filament looks like. And these are made up of the protein keratin, which is also the protein that is found in our hair and our nails. And the third type of protein is a micro, or the third type of filament is microtubules, and it is made up of tubulin. It doesn't say here, I'm going to spell it out. It's called tubulin. Now it's a hollow filament right here. You can see the hollow. So it's it's a hollow filament that is made up of bead-like structures. So these three together form the structural framework of the cytoskeleton. The next organelle that we're going to look at is the centrosome or the centriole. The centriole is a protein based structure. It is made up of tubulin and it helps with cell division. So during mitosis, you have the centrioles or the centrosomes move to the opposite corners of the cell. And these are the structures that are going to be synthesizing that spindle fiber that pulls the chromosomes apart. So if you recall mitosis, in the early stages of mitosis, you have these centrioles that travel to the opposite poles of the cell and start to synthesize spindle fibers. Here's a really nice transmission electron micrograph of what these centrioles actually look like. Now in eukaryotic cells that have cilia or flagella, so cilia are, are little finger-like projections that can help with the function of the cell, or flagella, which are locomotory organelles. So cells that have cilia and flagella a lot of times are found um, that, that they build, the centrioles build the cytoskeleton that is required for those organelles as well. The next structure that we're going to go over is microvilli. Now, microvilli is a edge of the cell that looks like a brush border. So what you see here, these large finger-like projections, their job is to basically increase the surface area of the cell. So you find a lot of microvilli in our intestinal tract, on our taste buds as well. And, and the microvilli, what it does is increases surface area so that more food and nutrients are absorbed rather than if the cell was flat and had lesser surface area. Coming to cilia and flagella, now, cilia are usually seen in our upper respiratory tract. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of the cilia lining the trachea. The trachea is the tube that takes air into our lungs. Now, these cilia are short hair-like structures that are beating outwards. Now, think about it. When they're beating outwards, their, their job is to kind of keep debris, dust particles, any kind of foreign materials from going into our lungs. So they're they're kind of pushing all the dust and debris outwards. Flagella are locomotory organelles, and they move an entire cell. In human beings, the only example of a cell with flagella is the sperm cell. Right here, you see a scanning electron micrograph of a sperm cell with a flagella. And the flagella is what helps the sperm swim and fertilize the egg as it's coming down the fallopian tube in the woman. The next set of organelles that we're going to go over are the ribosomes. Now, if I were to put it in one sentence, ribosomes are nothing but protein factories. In human beings, we have ribosomes that are mostly located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to go over what rough endoplasmic reticulum is in just a minute. They're often found in the nucleolus, which is where they're made, or they could be also found in the cytoplasm. And the job of these ribosomes is to synthesize proteins. So let's look at a picture right here. Now here's the nucleus of the cell right here. And the endomembrane system present right 
to the periphery of the nucleus is called the um, endoplasmic reticulum. So you have two types of endoplasmic reticulum. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is called rough because it looks pebbly in appearance. And as it moves towards the periphery of the cell, that pebbly appearance kind of disappears and it looks smooth. Hence, it is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So you have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and all of these dark spots that you see here, those are the ribosomes. And the job of the ribosome is to make proteins. Now, the job of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is to synthesize carbohydrate and to synthesize lipids. So rough ER produces proteins because it has ribosomes on it. Smooth ER produces lipids and fatty acids, steroids, all of that comes under the lipid category, and it also synthesizes carbohydrates. Now the next structure that is also part of the endomembrane system is the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus. It's named after Camilio Golgi, the, the, the scientist that first described it, and it looks like a flattened stack of pancakes to be perfectly honest. So this is an illustration of the Golgi apparatus. So it is not attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. It synthesizes carbohydrates and it packages proteins. So the, the packaging of proteins into its primary, uh, in, into its secondary structure, tertiary structure, all of that is taking place in the Golgi apparatus. Now, here's a nice transmission electron micrograph of the Golgi apparatus. And you will see that the it is curved so that the free edges are towards the periphery of the cell. Now, because it's the packaging center, you have to have proteins and lipids, which are synthesized in the ER, have to be transported here somehow. And that happens through little bubbles called transport vesicles. So once the protein is synthesized, a little bit of the endoplasmic reticulum gets pinched off. So this pinched off endoplasmic reticulum is now a bubble carrying this protein that has to be packaged. And this transport vesicle is going to go to the Golgi apparatus and it is going to fuse and or become one with the Golgi apparatus. So that the side that is the incoming side of the Golgi apparatus is called its cis phase. So cis phase is where the transport vesicle comes in and becomes one with the Golgi apparatus. Now the protein gets packaged and processed and carbohydrate gets synthesized. Now stuff from here has to eventually end up somewhere. It's not going to stay here. So that is going to, a part of the Golgi apparatus is going to get pinched off carrying whatever it's carrying, and it is going to go somewhere else. Now this carries, this bubble here carries a finished product of some kind. And that is called a secretory vesicle. So a secretory vesicle carries either an enzyme or a, a fully finished protein, and it's going to go somewhere else. We're going to look at some more sec secretory vesicles in just a little bit. But the secretory vesicle originates out of the exit phase. The exit phase is also known as the trance phase of the Golgi apparatus. So you have the cis phase, which is the incoming phase, and the trance phase, which is the exit side of the Golgi apparatus. So this illustration very clearly shows you the different steps of how stuff gets packaged and processed. So this gray structure here is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and you see the ribosomes. So protein synthesis takes place. A transport vesicle gets pinched off, carrying this yellow chain of amino acids. So the transport vesicle comes in through the cis phase, fuses, and becomes one with the Golgi apparatus, and now this, in, uh, now this um, amino acid chain is inside the Golgi apparatus. So as it goes through the different cisternae of the Golgi apparatus, it undergoes processing 
And by the time it's at the exit phase, it is a fully finished product. So it could produce an enzyme and take it somewhere through a transport vesicle, or it could produce membrane proteins, go fuse with the plasma membrane and carry this finished product there, or it could take proteins to be exited outside of the cell via exocytosis. Now, one of the secretory proteins, or, or sorry, the secretory vesicles, is a lysosome. So think of the lysosome as the garbage disposal of a cell. So what the lysosome does is that it has hydrolytic or digestive enzyme. So it has pro proteases, it has um, lysozyme, it has a lot of enzymes that can break down, hydrolyze, or digest stuff. Now once, so here's the transmission electron micrograph of a lysosome. So once a lysosome engulfs a foreign particle, it is going to hydrolyze it, and it is going to purge it out by exocytosis. Here are some more secretory vesicles. One of the secretory vesicles that is the site for chemical reactions. So think of it. Think of what is going on over here. It's converting. It's not breaking stuff down. It's converting one thing into another. So it's detoxifying. It's, it's converting one chemical into an, another. Now, this is a detoxification center, and it's abundant in our liver. And one of its jobs is to convert alcohol into blood sugar. The next secretory vesicle is a proteasome. A proteasome is very similar to a lysosome. However, a proteasome exclusively breaks down unnecessary damaged uh, proteins. The next organelle that we're going to go over is the mitochondria. The mitochondrion is its own structure in the sense that it has its own DNA. The DNA of the mitochondria is called mitochondrial DNA, or M, small m DNA, and it can only be inherited maternally. Now, the theory behind why mitochondria has its own DNA is the theory of endosymbiosis, which states that at some point, um, when, when the primitive eukaryotic cell was forming, the mitochondria was actually a prokaryotic free-living organism that formed a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with the eukaryotic cell. Now, one of the jobs, the major job of the mitochondria is to produce ATP by oxidative metabolism. So if you think about it, our muscle cells, which help us maintain our temperature, contract and relax, they're the ones that have to generate the most ATP. Kidneys, a, a liver, those are some more organs that, have, that are richly supplied with mitochondria. So the mitochondria looks like a kidney bean from the outside. And if you look at a longitudinal section here, or sorry, a transverse section here, in a transverse electron micrograph, you see these finger-like projections jutting inside into the internal space. Now these are called cristae. Cristae are those folds, the finger-like folds that are present um, inside the mitochondria. And the membrane of the mitochondrion is called the mitochondrial membrane. So when you think about generating ATP, we're talking about glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain. So glycolysis takes place in the plasma membrane. Krebs cycle takes place in the mitochondrial matrix, which is the space inside the mitochondria. And these little dots that you see here are enzymes. And the electron transport chain takes place in the mitochondrial membrane. Now let's come to the command center or the control center of the cell, the nucleus. 
the nucleus is the most distinct uh, structure inside of a cell. So if, you if you're looking at a light micrograph, one of the first structures that you'll see inside the cell is its nucleus and possibly the nucleolus. So it's a very large structure. And one of the jobs of the nucleus is to hold the genetic information or DNA. It's usually either spherical or kind of oblong oval in shape. The membrane of the nucleus is called its nuclear envelope, and it's not a continuous envelope. It has pores or holes in its surface called nuclear pores. And we'll talk about why nuclear pores are necessary in just a second. The nucleus also holds an organelle called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is the center that produces ribosomes. Now remember, ribosomes are the protein factories of the cell. The nucleolus is not the protein factory of the cell. The nucleolus is the factory that manufactures the machines of the protein factory. So think about it that way. So here's a picture of the nucleus. You can see these pores right here, which are called the nuclear pores. This is the nucleolus right here, and that's producing ribosomes. Now, what are the, whatever the ribosome components that are produced here travel out into the cytoplasm through those nuclear pores. Now, one of the things that I'm going to go over before I finish this chapter is just a quick overview of the central dogma uh, or, or, or what is commonly called gene expression. So when we say gene expression, from DNA to protein, that is what we're talking about. So you're seeing here a picture of a cell. Here's its nucleus with its nuclear pores. Now in the nucleus, you have DNA, which is this purple double helical structure right here. Now the DNA undergoes something called transcription and gets converted to RNA, or ribose nucleic acid. This ribonucleic acid is also called the mRNA, or the messenger RNA. So DNA getting converted to messenger RNA is called transcription. So after transcription, this messenger RNA exits the nucleus through the nuclear pore, and ends up in the cytoplasm. So right here, this brown helical structure that you see is mRNA. Now something else is hanging out here, the ribosome. Now in conjunction with the ribosome and the mRNA, and another RNA called T or transfer RNA, in a process called translation, a protein is created. So let me clarify that last part one more time. So the messenger RNA exits the nuclear pore, ends up in the cytoplasm. You have the ribosomes that are hanging out here. You have the T or the transfer RNA that is hanging out here. So these three things are coming together. The ribosome, the messenger RNA, and the transfer RNA together form, form proteins or amino acids in a process called translation. So translation is also commonly referred to as protein synthesis. So this diagram goes a little bit more into detail about it. So this purple sausage-like structure is the mRNA. Remember, this just came out of the nuclear pore after transcription. Here, this large structure, you have the smaller unit of the ribosome, you have the larger unit of the ribosome. So the ribosome comes in and attaches itself to this mRNA. Another type of RNA called the transfer RNA or the tRNA comes in. And in the end, after the process of translation, you have an amino acid chain right here. This amino acid chain can go to the Golgi apparatus to get packaged, processed, and turned into whatever protein that it is eventually going to turn into.